Hello everybody, welcome to another episode from the DJ Anish series bringing you the best in Southeast Asian history. It's been some time since I've been on the airwaves. I've missed your presence. I've missed the sound of my monotonous voice that allows people to sleep. Sadly though, this will be one of the last few podcasts that I will release for your batch. The year's going to end soon, but more importantly, your A-levels are coming soon. So yeah, uh, this would be one of the last few podcasts, if not the second last podcast uh, for, for, for your batch. This year has been a difficult one. You've had to navigate many different things that have come your way, but I hope that you apply the same level of tenacity and the same heart in approaching all the challenges that come your way, just like the Southeast Asian governments did in very turbulent and very vulnerable times. I would say that what you guys have what you guys have been through is truly historic, pun intended. Ha 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 ha. Thank you. Well, um, today we are going to go into the second in a series of three revision lectures. The first one I I already released it um, slightly before your mid-year papers. So now I'm releasing one slightly before your prelims and. The last one uh, I will release also slightly before your A levels. All these revision lectures, hopefully, they help you to, you know, get a uh, a refresher on things. But there are some things that I want to highlight and emphasize as well. Hopefully, they will serve you well in the exams. It's not really about new content, or it's not really about you know um, something that you've never heard of before. It's just of reminders, mostly pertaining to do with argumentation, and then for SPQ, mostly to do with evaluation. So these are just kind of uh, reminders. If you need my voice to like just constantly, hey, you better study this and you better remember this and all that. If you need that kind of stuff, then just listen to this podcast as you're traveling from school or when you're at home or wherever you are, when you want to sleep or whatever it is, right? Um, if you do remember, the first of this series of revision lectures, it was called Inferno. And that was book one of the Divine Comedy by this poet called Dante. Uh, now we are going into book two of the Divine Comedy, and it's called uh, Purgatorio, which roughly translated talks about purgatory. In many ways, you guys are in purgatory right now, uh, in a halfway point between nowhere and nowhere. And uh, it, it's a very unsettling feeling. I get it, but uh, you know it, it's part of the process. And, and before you know it, the A levels will be here, and then we will finally reach book three, which is Paradiso, Paradise. So that's all something we can look forward to. Um, I hope to keep this uh, podcast meaningful. I I don't know how long it will be at this point in time because I got some things to emphasize, but um, I'll put time codes and all that so that you can um, listen to it in bite sizes and and see which one is relevant for you to to, to just hone in on. Um, And then the rest of the time, just continue your normal revision. Guys, that's one thing I want to affirm all of you all. You guys have been doing your revision, you guys have been doing work at consults and, and, and in class and all that kind of stuff. So trust yourself, especially in the essays, um, because we've dealt a lot with essays since the mid-years to now. So I expect to see quite a bit of improvement over there. And with the SPQ, just some reminders here and there, I think we, we should be fine. Okay. So yeah, let's go into the lecture itself. Now, um, going into the scope of coverage, I think by now I don't really don't really need to belabor this point, but everything is covered by this point in time. The major difference between the first revision lecture and this revision lecture is that um, for the AFC, right now I'll be testing everything, causes, cause, uh, causes consequences, and uh, responses. And then for uh, team three, interstate tensions and cooperation, the IST portion, that one I will be testing everything as well. So it's not, you know, uh, like no, no conflicts will be excluded or, or anything like that. Lah. Okay, so that's it. At this point in time, it just occurred to me that some of you might be thinking, holy crap, Mr. Ko is going to give some hints in this uh, podcast. No, repeat after me. This podcast is in no way a hint as to what's coming out at the prelim exams. Okay, so... Take what you can from this podcast. Remember, the main objective and the main goal over here is the long game, which is the A-levels itself. And that one, I cannot predict. That one, I didn't set. Okay? So just take whatever you can from this. <coughs> oh, yeah. Some last a- ASMR for you guys. I-, I bet you all miss it. Going on into the themes itself, though, I, I know that the, the scope, the, 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 the overall syllabus, I know you guys know 
much about it. But let's go into some of the themes um, and uh, some of the things that I want to highlight in each of the themes. Okay, so now for those of you all doing PS and even for those of you all who have PS as Plan B, uh, these are some things to take note of. Now, when we talk about uh, questions in this uh, topic of PS, I, I need you all to pay particular attention to the operative word in the, in the question or some of the key terms in the question um, because sometimes the term will be political stability and then sometimes the term will be political development. So are there overlapping spaces between stability and development? Probably so, right? Probably there will be uh, similar things that you're going to look out for, similar things that you're going to argue. But with each of these terms, there are some specific things that are unique to them, some specific things that you really need to focus on or to spearhead your argument based on. Now, for political stability, we've been through this like a thousand times by now for uh, the unpacking of this term. We look at it from the elite or the governmental level, or we look at it from the mass or the societal level. Both of these levels will mutually affect one another, so it's important to consider uh, these different levels. The second thing to consider is that even in our calculations of political stability, we would need to take into account the economic and social dimensions as well. Because the economic and social dimensions will affect the degree of political stability, and political stability, the degree of it, it might translate into economic and social stability as well. So think of them as a, like a triangle, right? A tri triangulated relationship, and all of them will mutually affect one another. Remember, Cambridge is positive marking. The more layers you can show, the more relationships you can show, the more evaluation you can show, they, the more they can credit you for it. So explore the complexity of the term political stability. Use it to help your argument. So let's say, for instance, for instance, hypothetically, if the question has uh, the, the objective of assessing something about political stability, right? I would expect like some of these, if not all of these elements to appear in your argument so that we can get a good gauge as to whether governments were indeed effective in uh, achieving political stability across uh, the various case studies as well as across the time period. The second term over here under political stability, political development. Okay? Now, political development, I think there are some overlapping things uh, alongside stability. So it's, it's not entirely distinct from one another. But when we think about political development, especially this term here, development, we are looking at change and continuity across time. And this change, right, um, based on my, my reading of this term and based on the content that we have, it can be down to regime change. Like this is actual change in government or actual change in the ideological models that are applied to governance. So it could be from a democracy to a military regime, uh, just like what we saw in Burma or in Thailand. Or it could be a situation where you change leadership. Okay? So all the changes in the Thai leadership uh, change from Sukarno to uh, Suharto, change from Yunu to Nevin, and so on and so forth. So regime change is one aspect of political development uh, for you to consider. The second aspect of political development for you to consider is within the regime, within the government, within that leader, uh, is there an evolution to his or her politics? So it may have started out in a certain way, but over time, across his or her rule, uh, it, it changed and it evolved, and the style of governance may have modified or may have uh, ev evolved to adopt you know, some different characteristics uh, because of certain circumstances or whatever. But this one is not so much a change in government or a regime or ideological model or whatever. It remains within that, but there are some characteristical changes uh, within that. So even those kind of examples you can bring into a question that has the objective of looking at political development. So let's say, for instance, for instance, hypothetically, let's say the question is something like, uh, how how uh, important was uh, decal? Okay, how important was decal in um, shaping the political development of Southeast Asia? So, in that kind of question, when you look at the significance of decal in terms of 
regime change in terms of the evolution of the governance styles across time, across case studies as well. So that's something that I just want you guys to take note of, the operative work within uh, this uh, political stability, more or less is going to fall along these two like broad, broad uh, categories. Now, uh, for national unity, there is something that I, I think you guys are quite good with national unity and, and you know what's up with the topic. Um, there has been a point that I want to emphasize, beyond all the main points, lah, huh? but there's this one point that I want to emphasize over here with national unity, and it has to do with uh, government approaches or you know, the state approaches to uh, national unity. Basically, their social uh, policies and their social approaches. Lah. Now, um, it has come out in consults quite a few times already, but I just wanted to emphasize it over here. Now, when we talk about integrationist and assimilationist policies or integrationist and assimilationist styles, actually what we are looking at is the, the manner of which they approach um, the treatment of the various groups of people in their society. So, this is more of like a philosophy or like a, a style of their approach and, and things like that, rather than uh, an actual policy in itself. What do I mean by that is that Actually, when you go down into policies, you will go into more specific. So let's say, for instance, if you go into the social, cultural kind of policies, we're looking at things like education, language, religion, culture. If you go into politics, we're looking at political representation. If you go into economics, we're looking at uh, economic welfare, um, economic disparities, economic development, and so on. So these are the specific manifestations of the policies. And um, there could be both assimilationist and integrationist styles of these policies. So you could have an assimilationist education policy. At the same time, in somewhere else in Southeast Asia, you could have another government that is implementing an integrationist style of education policy. So why, why, why do I want to bring this up? It's because I want to show you that these two things are, are distinct. Number one, one is how you characterize the approach in, in very, very broad terms. So that's integrationist and assimilation. And one is, and the other one is the actual policy manifestations itself, um, going into greater specifics, going into different areas of uh, national unity management. Why is this important for you? Is because once you understand that you can go deeper, especially when you go into the policies, they can either continue to serve as your, your evidence um, for the approaches, or they can actually serve as points in itself. Like, one of the main comments that I have for national unity is, like, how much can I compare assimilation and integration? Actually, you can compare a lot, lah, to be honest, if you just want to stick with those terms. But if you're running out of points to compare like the, the, the overarching approaches or the styles itself, right? Actually, you can go down into the policy manifestations as evidence of deeper examples of, of uh, the, the various approaches and the levels of effectiveness over there. So that's something for you to consider as you do um, national unity questions. The other thing, uh, this one we covered in tutorials, is remember that for national unity questions, it's not all about the government perspective. In tutorials, I did give you all one question uh, that forced you all to look at it from the minority perspective. So considering the minority position, um, you know, their desires, their wants, and so on and so forth, considering what kind of role did they play in um, national unity efforts? You know, were, they, uh, uh, were, they, were they strengthening national unity efforts? Were they facilitating national unity efforts? Or were they hindering uh, national unity efforts? Um, also looking at you know, that question about whether it was better for them to adapt or whether it was better to, for them to resist. You know? So all these kind of things forces you to look at it a bit more from the minority perspective. So this is just a reminder that national unity is not all about from the state perspective. It can be from the minority community groups itself. One of the most important tricks in order to expand your argument is remember that the minority communities, they are not homogeneous. There are immigrant minorities and there are native minorities. Use that in order to expand your argument because they may have different experiences, they may have different responses, 
And you can use that to either strengthen your argument or to provide some sort of nuance um, to your argument. So that, 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 that further um, specification of the different types of minorities will actually help you. The last reminder over here is that don't, I mean, funnily enough, um, don't uh, forget the majority population because uh, majority attitudes can actually help you to majority attitudes can actually help you to um, go into uh, another layer of looking at the various permutations and actors and so on and so forth that is um, um, affecting national unity. So an entire paragraph could be run on the majority attitudes and how that helped or hindered um, the national unity efforts. Okay, so uh, that, those are things for you to consider for national unity. Okay, now going into team two, we're looking at economic development. Okay, you can pass the economic development, uh, ED for short. Remember that time we had the, I mean, very, very early on, this was even before COVID and all that, when we still had tutorials and all that, um, we, 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 we came up with certain frameworks looking at um, COSOT or SCOOT, however you want to phrase it. I hope you guys remember what it stands for and, and I, I'm, I'm, I hope it can help you uh, to, to kind of... Uh, give you ideas as to how to frame your argument and, and to give you points as well. Just for a refresher, COSOT, let's see if I remember. Challenges, opportunities, strategies, outcomes, and time. Yes, I remember it. Good job, Shane. Now, um, this framework, right, I feel that it can be quite useful for you in order to, once again, frame your arguments or to help you to generate some points and so on and so forth. Uh, usually, this framework will be very useful for questions of that measures effectiveness, or questions that you know ask you to ascertain whether or not Southeast Asian governments overcame their challenges and, and things like that. So, uh, yeah, that's something for you to consider. The other thing that I need you guys to consider also is about the human actors and the human agents within um, the economic sphere, how they operate. What are their unique roles and their responsibilities, uh, responsibilities, and and relatively speaking, how do they compare to one another in terms of their significance of contribution or maybe even devastation? But the idea here is to look at the relative relationship between the human agents um, in the economic activity and the economic sphere. So uh, the Broadly speaking, there are three categories of uh, human actors that are operating within um, the economic sphere. We are looking at state actors, which is mostly governments. We are looking at domestic non-state actors, which can be the private sector, uh, it can be the immigrant communities, it can be just you know, the population at large. Uh, basically, anything that's not government would fall under um, the, non the domestic non-state actors. And then, of course, there are the external actors as well. These can be countries, these can be organizations, um, but basically they are external to Southeast Asia. But they do affect Southeast Asian economic development. In terms of sectors, the, your syllabus has identified three specific ones for you. Agriculture, industry, finance. Um, I'm adding in export because I think export industries are useful for us to... Uh, run points on industrialization or trade and so on and so forth. So, um, primarily, I think these are the four big um, sectors to consider when you want to evidence development, um, when you want to compare uh, between uh, aspects of development. So, these are the four things to, to consider. Um, in terms of ideological models, I think in the mid-years, if I'm not wrong, I, said, I, I already said this question, which doesn't mean that it can't come out again. Uh, just a caveat over there. Um, economic ideological models, we looked at capitalism and socialism. Now, primarily, when you unpack these kind of things, we are uh, looking at their manifestations in terms of their treatment towards the private sector, their relationship they create with the external environment, and the degree of governmental control, you know, whether the government is decentralized or centralized and how that affects um, uh, economic activity, does it spur it on or does it actually compromise on economic activity? Um, all these three big things are prescribed by the ideological models. Um, 
a, a very frequent comment that I keep making whenever you all run socialist models and, and the paragraphs on socialism is that I want you guys to keep layering it with Cold War politics because remember those two events are concurrent um, and the Cold War politics actually does restrict socialist economic planning a lot more especially in the external trade and external relationships dimension, it does restrict it a lot more because of politics and Cold War bipolarity. So that's something that uh, you, you, can, you, can, you can try to include in a bit more when you're running socialist paragraphs. And the last thing uh, to consider when we look into the permutation of uh, economic development is the role of external events and circumstances. So of course, I don't think this list is exhaustive. You can identify any event or circumstance that is external but did affect Southeast Asia. This is a separate point, uh, by the way, from the external actors. Um, collectively, they are all under the broad term external, but just now we were looking at actors, and then um, here we are looking at events and circumstances. So, um, things like decol, the global decolonization movement, the Cold War, external crisis and shocks, uh, rise of developmental states and competition like China and India and so on. So I think all these external movements will affect Southeast Asia as well. You can even bring in AFC knowledge about uh, investor speculation and you know things like that, or even uh, the IMF liberalization policies. All these all these things can uh, external events and and circumstances and um, it does affect Southeast Asia. I, I guess the, the the big question here would be. Uh, when you, I mean, when you think about external events, how, how significant a role do they play? Or external actors, how significant a role do they play? And of course, I think the natural counterpart when you're looking at um, this framework would be then to compare them against domestic actors, which is basically the state or non-state actors. And so in that kind of relative relationship, back to what I was saying at the start, uh, you need to make some evaluation moves to, to, to weigh their significance against one another and to ascertain their degree of contribution. So I guess that's what is, is really all about, right? Because all these actors are there because they contribute something to Southeast Asian economic development. So they are there already by virtue of their contribution. So that's not the task. The task is for you to weigh the relative importance, to evaluate the relative importance of uh, different actors or different factors or different circumstances, one against each other, to arrive at this relationship of factors where some factors are more contributive or more significant than others because of whatever, whatever reason. Okay, so that's the final goal that we want to try to, to create. So yeah, I think that's for ED. The last one uh, is, uh, no surprises, is on AFC. Um, this time round, as I mentioned earlier, the main difference between now and the mid-years is that uh, it's free for all right now, right? Uh, it's, no, it's no longer just causes of the AFC, we're looking at consequences and we are looking at um, responses as well. So in short, in terms of time periods, we are looking at pre-crisis, we are looking at the initial crisis response, we are looking at later crisis responses, we are looking at the escalation period, we are looking at the recovery period, basically everything uh, all the way to the year 2000, if you want to stretch it as far as that. Now, when you see an AFC question, this, this part is a bit tricky, okay? Because um, you need to first ask yourself this question. How extensive is the question in its coverage? Now, what do I mean by this? When you read the question, you need to ask yourself, how far can I go? Okay, if the question, let's say, is asking you on this factor, okay, let's just call it factor X, towards the outbreak of the AFC. I mean, with the terminology outbreak of the AFC or you know, something similar to that, more or less you're kind of cutting it off in July 97, maybe a bit more itself, but you're not really going to go on beyond that because you're looking at the initial eruption point. So a lot of your factors and, your, and your, uh, the, the determinants that you bring up, they are really going to be uh, uh, constrained and restrained to that point in time. So mostly you're going to be looking at pre-crisis stuff. You're going to look, be looking at um, more immediate developments in the 1990s. You're definitely going to be looking at the 
um, investor speculation in 97 itself, you know, things like that. But beyond that, you, you're not really required, lah, I, I guess, because of the term outbreak of the crisis and, and therefore there's a scope over there. However, if the term is, is something broader, uh, let's, say, let's say the term is something to the effect of, um, fact, okay, same thing, factor X, right? Factor X uh, in the devastation of the crisis. Or let's say, why did countries, I think one of the popular questions is, why did some countries, why were some countries more devastated by the AFC than others? So actually these kind of questions, and I think we've dealt with some of them in the tutorial, these kind of questions actually allow you a much, much broader scope in terms of your answer because you can bring in uh, not just the pre-crisis period, not just investor speculation period, but you can bring in the response management period as well. The, the responses to the crisis and whether that helped it or whether that like compounded on it further. So uh, those kind of things is, is, is for you to really read the question and to determine like, how much info can I bring in or how scoped is this question. Uh, and that's something I, I really need you all to uh, pay attention to. If the question is broad, please show, once again, show the layering of your argument. Show not just pre-crisis stuff, but you know, show crisis responses as well. Bring in that kind of scope will definitely help you to create more points and, and will help you to uh, uh, create a, a more holistic argument accounting for you know, the, 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 the devastation seen in the AFC. Or I think there's one popular question that you're, you're, a lot of you all did in the consult package from, I think, ACJC. Did the AFC review more strengths than weaknesses? You know, that kind of question also can bring in responses, right? So you, with AFC, you, you need to judge these kind of things. How far can you bring, um, how much content and how far can you bring it? Um, with regards to AFC, we are, uh, same thing, we are looking at the human agents. Uh, there are those kind of questions where we are looking at the state, which is the government, domestic, non-state, which is like the banks themselves, the finance, uh, the the producers, the manufacturers, the exporters, and so on. Um, the ex and as well as the external actors and the circumstances. So, looking at investor speculation, looking at the IMF, and so on and so forth. So, uh, looking at the, in terms of circumstances, we are looking at the era of liberalization. So, a lot of these kind of things um, will be associated lah, with these kind of actors that you see over here. Um, a, a reminder, I think I did remind you all this before, that whenever you bring in... Um, whenever you look at um, the AFC, it is an economic issue, but especially in terms of its consequences and even in the responses bit as well, um, there are social and political consequences as well. And it would be good for you to bring those points in uh, to layer the argument further. So let's say going back to the question on devastation, we are looking at how some countries were more devastated based on the fact that just wasn't just an economic crisis, but it spilled over into a social and political crisis as well. So these kind of indicators and measurement standards can help you to differentiate the different degrees of devastation across case studies and, and so on and so forth. Um, the relationship is, is very mutually compounding. So usually if there's social and political upheaval, the economic recovery will take a longer time because of that social disturbance. Um, usually, if the economic management is bad, it would spill over into economic, sorry, it would spill over into socio-political upheaval. So that relationship is quite um, mutually reinforcing as well. Um, the last thing I want to, to highlight, uh, and this has come up quite a, quite a, quite a bit in consults, um, is the time factor in crisis responses. Now, I want you guys to see that in terms of the crisis responses, um, there, is, there is a need for you to, to periodize it. There are the earlier initial responses to the crisis and then there are the later responses to the crisis. This is true of the state governments of Southeast Asia, but it is also true of the IMF. So, initial, broadly speaking, the initial responses were badly miscalculated or there was no political will or it was inadequate and so on and so forth. Basically, it was bad. But from a certain point onwards, uh, things started to get more calibrated. 
uh, things started to get more constructive. So I think even in the responses period, you need to periodize it and to see how that can help your argument. Because um, it, it will be, I think it will be a bit um, narrow and it might be a bit wrong to just look at the initial responses and judge everything based on that. Uh, you should look at the responses in its entirety and then make your judgments based on that. It is still wide open. You can still criticize them or you can still affirm them. It's up to you. But I think to give them the fair chance, you should look at the holistic response management period and then judge uh, from there. Uh, so I'm, that's, that's to do with the four, the four uh, topics that we have for essays. Um, this is a slide that I, I took from the mid-year revision. So it's just a, a reminder on the different question types and what you want to do with them uh, or what you need to do with them, how you want to structure your argument and all that. I, I won't go into it, um, but yeah, if you want, you can just revisit the mid-year revision slides and, and hear this out. And the last thing over here that I want to cover is uh, to do with SPQ. So theme three, regional conflicts and cooperation. Now, as I mentioned this before, um, looking at A-level trends, I have seen that a... <laughs> how should I put this? I've seen that the, the trend has been that they are setting very specific uh, topics. So, the first year was Saba, uh, the second year was um, Zotfan, and then the third year was uh, Petrabanka. So, you, you can see that they are going deep, alright? Yeah, maybe maybe the, the, the... I mean, if you don't like the term specific, then they are going deep into certain issues or certain events. Uh, they are quite specific. Um, so that's a trend. I mean, does that mean anything? Honestly, no. They can do whatever they want, basically. Because, you know why? <laughs> Not going to add this on public, but yeah. Um, where was I? See, got lost. My train of thought got lost. Oh, yes, yeah, so specific, right? So uh, I think it's best to, to, to prepare for that, that kind of scenario. While at the back of your mind, uh, just, just, just keep in mind that, that they can have broad kind of assessments and, and topics as well. Uh. Um, okay, so going into the two topics under this theme, looking at interstate tensions, ISD, um, primarily the questions here would revolve around the nature and the responsibility uh, surrounding all these conflicts. So nature, we are looking at, you know, like what, what, what was the core issue about? Like what was... Why did this conflict begin? What, what were they fighting over and, and so on and so forth? Responsibility, I think that was quite obvious looking at like who is more to blame for the, um, the, the, the conflict itself. Um, but I think the thing I want to emphasize here right, is that these conflicts are usually so multidimensional that there will, be, there will probably be a number of factors or there will be probably a number of areas of responsibility that is covered uh, uh, to account for the conflict. So the task, once again, is not to dispute that, oh, this party has no responsibility. Uh, oh, uh, there is no, there's, no dim there's no security dimension to this conflict. It it's not about that. It's about acknowledging that there are security dimensions. It's about acknowledging that there are points of responsibility from the Singapore side. But evaluating it and showing that Perhaps, oh, the economic dimension has, has, is, is, is more of a core issue, more about what they were fighting about. Or uh, the other side, oh, it's more of country X that is more responsible despite Singapore's responsibility because of whatever, whatever. So that's the kind of thing we want to do in SBQ. With the opposing view, you don't need to shut it down, right? In the sense that you don't need to shut it down completely 100%. There are things that you can acknowledge about the opposing view, but it's just that the, the, the view that you are leaning towards to, the view with the stronger set of sources, they do mount a stronger argument. Their claims are more reliable, they are more credible, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the kind of relationship that we want to conclude by the end of uh, SPQ exercise. Well, just like the essays, guys, we are, we are arguing over here. We want to form a relationship of factors. The only difference between source base and essays is the sources itself. You, you need to use the sources, but you're still constructing an argument. You're going to have an opposing view that you can acknowledge some bits of it, 
but you're going to evaluate it, you're going to critique it in some way and show that your main argument is much stronger, the main set of sources is much stronger uh, than the opposing one. So that's the, the, the same kind of thing, right, we're doing in essays and SPQ. Um, okay, and then the last one here is on ASEAN. So now with ASEAN, there are, I mean, the way I look at it, there are three kind of like broad stuff. Um, we are looking at the formation of ASEAN to start off with. So over here, we have to take it from the start, right? Why was ASEAN formed? In fact, it's one of the big um, bullet points in your... Um, it's one of the big bullet points in your syllabus document. I think it's the first one, if I'm not wrong. Uh, formation of ASEAN. Basically, you know, why was it formed? Uh, looking at the different motivating factors, here I want to highlight um, something very important, that the formation of ASEAN is, is so complex because there's so many... Um, concurrent things going on um, and, and therefore till today scholars are debating over uh, the actual purpose and, and the reason for the formation of this organization over here I, I did put that they are cut across national regional and international lines now what this means is that when you delve into the formation of ASEAN each of the five member states they have their own national motivations um, some play a bigger role than others, like definitely Indonesia and Thailand. Right? These are the two power brokers of uh, ASEAN and, and the formation of this new organization. So, you know, uh, they have their set of motivations, but don't discount the other smaller states as well because, you know, they have their own set of mo uh, motivations as well. Um, but that's the national level, looking at their national motivations and, and all that kind of stuff. Then we go into the regional level where we have uh, the need to reconcile from current interstate tensions that were going on at that point in time. Or maybe there, is, there was a desire to strengthen the region uh, as a whole, or you know, just in general. Not, not really tied to anything, maybe tied to the idea that uh, this is a region emerging from decor, freshly independent, so they want to strengthen themselves, you know, that kind of motivations. Um, and yeah, just uh, regional cooperation in, in different aspects, especially uh, in terms of economy. So those are the regional level kind of motivations which layer the national ones. They may coincide, they may overlap. And the last one is the international um, influences. And obviously over here, I, I'm looking at the Cold War. And uh, more immediately, I'm looking at the Vietnam War as well. So this, this, how, how does Cold War bipolarity you know, uh, influence the formation of ASEAN. I think that's something that we all really need to think about. Um, and we're looking at how uh, there is an intersection between certain member states and Cold War politics. So definitely Cold War would have an influence in the formation as well. So my point over here is this, is that all these forces and influences, I think they definitely do play a part in the formation of ASEAN. The question now is, um, once again, that relative comparison. You know, what seems to be that dominant issue? What seems to be the main spur uh, you know, behind the formation of ASEAN? So that's something for you to um, take note of. It's important in this topic to know the leaders, you know, the foreign ministers. It's important for this topic for you to know um, the events you know, around 67 itself and, and, and in the near vicinity. For formation topic, you, I don't think you really need to go beyond, like too much beyond 1967 because you're already asking why are they formed. So it's, it's pretty much kind of like scoped over there. So in terms of that, you really need to know the individuals and the personalities and the country stances and the role of the Cold War at that point in time and the role of interstate tensions at that point in time. So those are the things in the mix la, for formation. The second one over here is about assessing effectiveness. Now ASEAN is created to manage regional affairs. Most prominently, we are looking at security as well as economic cooperation. So with regards to the various conflicts that appear or with regards to the various initiatives at regional economic development, that's what ASEAN is tasked to do. That's what ASEAN wants to do. Uh, in terms of managing regional affairs, it, it does fulfill the Bangkok Declaration. So uh, those revolve around that. I mean, it's seemingly simple. Lah. You're just measuring effectiveness. So 
uh, actually for these kind of topics, when you measure ASEAN's effectiveness, you can actually prepare them beforehand, like your arguments and, and so on and so forth, because you can actually unpack effectiveness and uh, think for yourself what kind of indicators you're looking out for in terms of security management, in terms of economic cooperation. Actually, all these kind of things you can pre-prepare beforehand. And then when you see the sources, you see la, if, if it does appear there, then actually it's just a, you can just transplant it down. Actually, same thing la, for the formation of ASEAN. You can kind of think to yourself, like you pre-prepare the country stance or the country motivations or, or the role of IST or the Cold War and whatnot. But once you pre-prepare this, then you get a better understanding um, of the formation. Then you see la, what the sources show you and, and then you, know, you can just... Apply it if it if it if it if it's applicable. Um, yeah, but same thing with ASEAN, as what I said in IST just now, the last point over here. We're looking at the complexity of factors and the different uh, levels of effectiveness. Same thing. It's not a hundred percent, zero percent kind of thing. It's more of a mixture where you can acknowledge certain things about the opposing view, but then you have a main argument to run and your efforts will be focused on evaluating the opposing view and then um, uh, running your main argument. Yeah. So uh, that's it for the unpacking of the syllabus. As I said, I, I didn't really know like how long this is gonna this podcast is gonna take because actually I have a second part to this podcast. I'm just gonna stop it here for now. Um, and perhaps I'll release this first and then uh, I will release the next thing. Uh, in as a part two la, to this this thing. Okay, cool. Very eloquently concluded over there. Goodbye, people. DJ Anesh out for now.